we have uh, our speaker, Lucinda McCordy, and or Lucy. And um, so Lucy is a student of the Ryerson School of Interior Design. Uh, she became interested in the profound impact of storytelling. A year later, after being accepted <clears throat> into, the, into the Master of Design graduate thesis program at Emily Carr University, she was able to put this interest into practice. Her graduate thesis proposed the use of storytelling as a perception shifting vehicle aimed at solving the burnout problem faced by individuals living with type 1 diabetes, including herself. Lucy now teaches design and storytelling at Ryerson University and George Brown College in Toronto. Uh, so without um, further ado, I will pass it on to Lucy. Okay, welcome. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, before we get started, if it's not too big of a nuisance, I would just want everybody to grab a pen or pencil and paper. Hopefully you just have that with you. Um, not mandatory, but could be useful for the, the talk. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll let everybody just kind of get organized. Pen and paper would be great. Uh, as Amy said, um, I'm also a type 1 diabetic. I've had T1D since 2000, so I'm coming up on my 20 year mark. Um, I'm a designer. I studied interior design and then I went on to do my master's in just general design. And I do instruct at both Ryerson and George Brown in Toronto. So today we are talking about design and diabetes and I'm just going to share my screen with you guys. So we're good. We can all see this shared screen. Amy? Yep. Okay. Perfect. So here we go. Using design to think differently about your diabetes. So again, we're talking about design and type one. This presentation is sort of a combination of what I teach my students at Ryerson, a bit of my own work. I've never actually presented this content before, so hopefully it all makes sense. There will be time at the end for some questions, concerns maybe, uh, depending on how this goes, but uh, feel free to ask anything. So just in terms of contents, what we're looking at today, what is design? How do we define design? What is the design process? Some examples to support my definition of design. Then we're jumping into what we call messy or complex design. And in that, we look at design in the environment and then design and type one. And then we're going to end on a conversation around co-design or what we might call participatory design. And then, like I said, there's a Q&A opportunity at the end. So what is design? The word design has lots of meaning. When I say I'm a designer, often people say, well, what do you do? Do you make clothes? Because I think a lot of people, when they think about design, the first thing they think about is the industry, right? So we have things like fashion design, which is the design of clothes. We have interior design, which is the design of spaces. We have UX or what we call user experience design. A lot of people think about the design of apps when they think of UX design. We have things like industrial design, which is also called product design. So furniture, cars, that type of thing. Urban design, obviously the design of our cities, right? So we have a lot of different design industries that we kind of think of when we think of design. But today I'm going to propose that we think of design. Sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt. We're still just stuck on the, the first screen. Is that supposed oh, to? Oh, sorry okay. about that guys. No, that's okay. No, nope, I'm glad you interrupted. Okay, so are we seeing the contents sheet here? No, not yet. Hmm. We'll try to reshare the screen, maybe that'll help. Yeah. Technology is lovely when it works. <laughs> are, you, are we on the... Yes, yes. I can see and that. And then it, has it changed yeah. slides? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yes. guys. There we go. <laughs> Thanks for interrupting. Okay, so 
like I said, the go-to is sort of to think about the design industry if you are what we call maybe a non-designer. But today I wanna to propose that we think about design as a problem solving tool, right? So the idea that we can use design to solve both simple and complex problems using what we call the design process. So everyday designers out there, they're solving problems. So if we look at the design process, you know, what do I mean by this? It's a series of steps that designers take to identify a problem and then to creatively solve that problem. So let's just walk through them. The first one is to build empathy. And what that looks like is learning about your user, the person who is going to use the design that you come up with. Sometimes we refer to this person as the audience or the end user. So you learn about this person or these people or this animal, whatever it is that you're designing through both observation and conversation, maybe an informal interview. And you're building empathy, you're learning about them and you're getting on their side. And from that initial observation, that initial conversation, you're able to define your problem statement. This is based on your learnings, your users' needs, and those insights. The third step is you ideate. You start to come up with ideas through brainstorming exercises, and you want to come up with as many ideas as possible. After the brainstorming or the ideation phase, you pick some of these ideas and actually mock them up, or what we call prototype these ideas so that you can show and share these ideas with others in the final testing phase for feedback, right? So if there's one takeaway from this presentation, it's that we can use design to solve problems. Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind is that design and the design process is very much iterative, meaning it involves multiple iterations, multiple do-overs. So a designer may start prototyping before they fully defined their problem statement. They might receive some negative feedback and go back to the drawing board, right? So it's this sort of cycle of doing, asking, thinking, changing, making, and it all sort of gets uh, sort of revolves around this cycle of the iterative process. But for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of this presentation, I really do want you to think of the design process as the series of five steps that I just outlined. So it's non-linear, but today we're thinking of it as a linear process. So I just want to run through two design project examples that I think really work through the design process well and are examples of problem solving. So the first one comes from the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where a team created what they call the adventure series. Very simple design where they reimagined the look of imaging equipment, including, as you can see, the MRI machines, the x-ray machines, and the CT scanners to make these procedures less scary for kids. So with this MRI machine, the designers walked through this design process, right? They built empathy, they were able to define a problem, started working on some ideas through the ideation phase, actually prototyped and tested. So initially, they, the insight, the key insight that they gathered was that many children are scared of the MRI procedure. And as a result, they require sedation. And sedation is not only an additional scary process for both children and their parents, but it's very time consuming and it's also very expensive for the hospital. So this is a big problem at this particular hospital. So from this insight, from these designers observing and talking and 
interviewing, they were able to define the problem, which is how can we transform this scary experience into something adventurous and exciting? And through the ID8 process, you know, they reimagined the MRI experiencing, experience, sorry, through brainstorming exercises and tried to come up with as many different ideas as possible. And what they landed on was essentially the beginnings of the adventure series idea, which were these prototypes that had stickers on them. And these stickers transformed some of these imaging technologies into a pirate ship or a space shuttle. And of course, they tested these and there was very positive results, including a six-year-old saying, you know, can we come back tomorrow? Because this once very scary procedure was now perceived as something sort of exciting. Eventually, they brought in um, volunteers from a children's museum who made, you know, a whole kind of show and presentation of you're now going on a pirate ship and this is what it's going to look like and if you hear something this is what it means and it almost gamified the experience for these kids the second design example i want to share comes from montgomery alabama it's called the national memorial for peace and justice and it's the first memorial ever in america to really take a step, a major effort towards confronting the racial terror, terror lynchings that occurred in the South. And what it looks like is, and it's maybe a little bit hard to see in this image, but hanging from the ceiling are a series of over 800 pillars. And on each pillar is the name of a county, and below the county is a list of names. And altogether, there's over 4,400 individuals listed on these steel pillars. And outside of the memorial, there's an identical pillar. And the intention is that the county that that pillar represents actually takes ownership of that pillar and brings it to the county and it's its own small memorial within that county. So it's a step towards acknowledging all of what has happened and what has occurred in the South. So again, a very different looking project with a very different intention, but the designers would have walked through a very, very similar process, right? Empathy, define, ideate, prototype, test. So the real insight there was the discussion about lynching and its legacy has been very inadequate. And this has, of course, contributed to the ongoing struggle. So how do we design a memorial that provides the necessary space for truth telling, hope, healing, reconciliation? So the designers and the team building this memorial would have sat down and from this problem statement would have begun the ideation phase. And from that, this team developed a series of what we call virtual walkthroughs. So they designed rough prototypes of the potential memorial space. They created these virtual walkthroughs and they got feedback on these walkthroughs, right? And the one that ended up turning into the memorial that we now know, the feedback was this is a very powerful way to give a sense of the scale of the bloodshed right, because we're walking below these pillars, right, and it's a bit reminiscent of the lynchings and that these pillars are also outside and have the opportunity to be in a different place. So, in the world of design, we would consider the MRI project and even the memorial project relatively small problems, even though they're not, even though they contribute to a much larger societal change, etc. But we also have what we call these big, sometimes messy, complex problems. They're also referred to as wicked problems, but I prefer the word messy in design. And there's a reason why we call them messy. 
they are difficult to solve because of their incomplete, contradictory, and often changing requirements that are hard to recognize and isolate. So sometimes when we think of a messy design problem, we just picture a tangled web. You know, a whole series of small problems contributing to a much, much bigger problem. So the way designers work to solve these messy problems is by tackling the smaller, more isolated problems that again exist within a much larger context. And the impact of their work is significant only when combined. So it's hard to say that their impact is significant on an individual scale, but when combined, we feel that impact. So designers may never fully solve a messy problem, but they, what's really important is that they're taking the necessary steps towards solving the messy problem, towards finding a solution. And a very important part of the messy problem solving process is what we call co-design or participatory design. And this is where we work in these large interdisciplinary settings, these very big collaborative settings of designers and non-designers. And we're gonna discuss co-design at the end of this, but I just wanted to point that out. But first I just want to discuss a messy problem that designers around the world are constantly working on and that of course is the fight against climate change. So this subject is very dear to my heart um, but more importantly by studying environmental design we can pull out some key learnings that can be applied to design for chronic disease and of course that includes type 1 diabetes. So environmental design projects, these offer small solutions to, again, what is a much larger problem, a big, complex, messy problem. And these solutions, these smaller solutions, they're what transform our thinking. They're what bring awareness. They offer this new perspective on how we might live a more sustainable life, on what the future might look like. So I just want to walk through a few of these key learnings, which then we'll bring into the discussion about type 1 diabetes. But the first key learning is that environmental design can offer us hope. It's a very optimistic view of environmentalism, which we all know can often be a very negative discussion. So there's many ways I could talk about this, but I thought one that's very obvious is the multiple initiatives happening right now to clean up our oceans. And this is a, a terribly big task and potentially will never fully um, <clears throat> come together. But again, what's important is that people are taking the necessary steps towards the cleanup. You know, many people think why even bother with this and a lot of people attack a lot of these initiatives because we're still generating a lot of garbage and the problem is the generating of the garbage it's not so much that it's in the oceans although that is a very big problem as well for our ecosystems but these initiatives these designers really show us another way of thinking about this stuff and it's really wonderful to see change to see action even if you don't fully fully believe this is the best way towards solving this problem there's action being taken so there's a group called the ocean cleanup project and their focus is very technology driven and specific to collecting trash in the ocean right so we could think about garbage cleanup on land we could think about it in all of the water vessels that lead to the oceans and we can think about it in the ocean itself. So again, a lot of people criticize their very expensive technology. They criticize their narrowed approach. You know, they think the cleanup should happen before it gets to the ocean stage. 
but I really believe that we should celebrate their success, right? They have decided to tackle this one particular part of this problem. And instead of knocking them down, we should be celebrating their success. This is not the solution to ocean waste, to ocean cleanup. This is one of many, many solutions. And in my opinion, this does offer us a sense of optimism. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> losing my voice. Because when we take their work and the statistics around their work and we combine those with other initiatives, that's where we start to see change in policy and change in behavior. Okay, the second key learning comes from one of my favorite designers and social activists, Ezio Manzini. And one of the things that he likes to talk about is what he calls SLOC. So small, local, open, connected. The acronym is SLOC. And a very perfect example of SLOC would be something like a farmer's market. So when we say small, we're talking about, is this project happening at the human scale? Can we understand it? Right, there's lots of things that are so big, they seem so beyond our understanding and they feel dangerous. But when something's small and at the human scale, we understand it and it's therefore in Ezio Manzini's opinion and my opinion, more sustainable. Local, a bit more self-explanatory, but a farmer's market brings together local farmers, it brings together local community members, all in the same place. And of course, it supports a local economy. Open, what he means by this is open source. They're not hiding anything at a farmer's market, right? There's often many detailed descriptions of where things come from, the structure of the farmer's market itself, right? We don't feel like we're being kept in the dark. It's very transparent. So open is open source and connected Farmers are connected to a much larger network outside of the farmer's market. So in no way does a farmer's market exist in a bubble. So although these projects should be small, they still need to be connected to a much larger context. The third key learning comes from the slow movement. This is probably a term a lot of you are familiar with because this has been now ongoing for many, many years. And the wonderful thing about the slow movement is that it still feels very relevant. So the key kind of idea around the slow movement is that we need to slow certain things down in our lives so that we feel more connected, so that we're more mindful, so that we have greater appreciation. But what I really want to stress is that the slow movement isn't about slowing everything down. They're often criticized for that. In no way do I want to slow my commute to work down, right? But it's about finding the right pace for things in our lives. A big part of the slow movement is the slow food movement. So we use the slow movement as an umbrella term for these smaller segments like slow food, slow design, slow fashion. So slow food really started in Italy. Carlo Petrini in the 80s came up with a manifesto because the first ever McDonald's was going to open. And so slow food was really a direct opposition to fast food. And really in this manifesto, he wrote about culture and tradition and the idea of food preparation and how we should enjoy food together. And it shouldn't be this fast, incredibly unhealthy thing in our lives that you know we're told will make things so much easier, right? We don't wanna work faster and actually we shouldn't work more hours simply because we have better, quicker access to food. So he was a big proponent of starting the slow food movement in Italy and it has since spread throughout the world. And slow design and slow fashion, very, very similar, <clears throat> sorry, in that it's a lot about mindfulness, it's about where are we getting our materials, where are we sourcing things, what does that process look like, and of course, what is the end life of our clothes? Because 
the life cycle currently of fast fashion is a huge contributor to the destruction of our planet. And then the last thing I want to talk about, again, when we think about environmental design, is just the idea of communication or communications, the idea of messaging. We've learned through so many different environmentalists, so many different activists over the years, that communication is key. That having a platform, standing behind your platform, understanding what you're saying, making it clear is super, super important, right? So the first, the first thing you think about is, is your message clear? In other words, do people understand what you're saying? And then the second thing is, is your message sticking? Does it resonate? Have you created some sort of mutual understanding? Right? So it's one thing for us to understand the concept of what you're saying, but are we on board? People often criticize Greta for being quote unquote calculated. You know, they have a problem with her uh, appearing to be very grassroots, but having somewhat of a brand to stand on. And I think this is absolutely crazy because um, she is a brand, no different than Jane Goodall is a brand. The word brand is very, very stigmatized because we think of big brands, big evil brands like Coca-Cola or McDonald's or Nike, right? And we, both, we all know that there's total elements to those brands too that aren't evil, but we'll leave that for another day. Um, but with Greta, it's so important that she is calculated in the sense that she understands her messaging and she's very clear and convincing about what she's saying and that she has put thought into all of this and that she does have people there supporting her to keep her messaging, again, consistent, clear, and convincing. Okay, so I just, part of environmental design is to break down some of those taboo feelings we have around the term marketing, communications, branding, etc. So if we then apply some of these key learnings to other areas of life that require long-term thinking, i.e. something like chronic disease, something like type 1 diabetes, we can really learn a lot. And one of the greatest challenges with environmental design is that it's not necessarily happening now. A lot of what we're designing is for the future. And with our diabetes, it's really hard to think about, okay, what I do today is going to impact me 20 years down the line, right? Human nature just says that that is just not <laughs> happening for us. It's really, really challenging. And that is, again, one of the biggest problems with environmentalism is this idea that we talk a lot about our children's future and our children's children's future. But both of these, when supported with design, build in the necessary resilience, the necessary sustainability factors that can help us move into a more healthy future. So we're just gonna take a quick look at some examples of the idea that design is optimism, the SLOC, Ezio Manzini concept, the slow movement and communication happening within the diabetes community because I think it's amazing that there's already so much out there in terms of design and type 1 diabetes. So again, these projects, in my opinion, really do help build resilience by using a lot of those similar principles to environmental design. So the first example, I'm sure a lot of you have read this or are familiar with Chuck Eichton's book, The Book of Better. He's a graphic designer, he's very funny. And this pretty short read offers us new ways of thinking about diabetes through these lovely illustrations, through this lovely graphic design, and through sort of some comic relief. 
The second example there is Deanna's D-Dance program. And this is something that offers workshops for kids with diabetes. And it's small, it's local, it's very open source, and it's connected again to a much larger type one diabetes community, but it maintains that feeling of smallness or closeness, right? We understand it's a comprehensible project. Um, a lot of you are probably also familiar with Judy, who's a Montreal based uh, park designer. She has the Hyper Hypo sports bra, which you can see in this image, has a pocket inside to hold your pump supplies or other diabetes supplies while slowing down and doing some exercise, which we all know is super important, not just for diabetics, but for everybody. And it's also a lovely example of the slow movement, just in the sense that um, for me as a Canadian, um, I can shop locally from a Montreal-based designer. I know we've got a lot of Americans with us today too, but there's tons and tons of American equivalents of shopping locally. And then the last uh, image, comes from a project I've been working on in the last couple months called One Talks. It's a podcast, brings together small groups of type one diabetic adults who are just there to discuss some experiences and each episode focuses on one word. So for instance, the first episode, the word is memory. And I have a few people just talking about what that word means to them in the context of their diabetes. Right, so the intention is for diabetics who may not be as much a part of the community or maybe they're newly diagnosed to really start to pick up on the, uh, the importance of knowledge transfer within the community. And then just four other design projects that um, again, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. The first one, of course, being the Riley link there's so much excitement, so much optimism around looping at the moment. Uh, at a conference last year, I literally could feel the buzz of positivity as uh, one fellow discussed his experience with the Riley link. Connected emotion, of course, is another example, perfect example of SLOC in that it is small, it feels intimate, and yet here we all are, much part, uh, part of a much, much larger community feeling connected. Uh, the Diabetic Health Journal, a lovely example of slow design, where over three months you're more actively recording your diabetes management in a beautifully graphically laid out journal. And then the last image there is another project I've worked on called the One Club. And essentially it's a campaign to attract people to the community. So not necessarily geared at you who are now part of the community, but again, maybe for people who are outside of the community. And the idea is that the community is a secret society of type one diabetics. They go about doing their daily rituals. The founding fathers are banting and best. They share their secret knowledge. So in a way for this project, I've branded the community as this sort of dark, somewhat mysterious club. And I just want to, hopefully this works. Show, show you what I would consider a campaign video or a little um, intro video to the One Club. We have no visual, we have audio. <laughs> No? Okay. I had a feeling that wouldn't, uh... Okay. 
no, you know what, no problem. I think I'll just show it at the end if we've got time because I've got to change the screen and I'm not so good with that. But essentially, it's just showing this little, you know, cartoon of this little woman uh, who receives a letter in the mail that says you're now part of this, you know, blood testing kindred, you know, the, the one club, the secret society, and it's her little journey going to uh, this secret location. All right, so it's really just playing off a new look, a new iconography for the diabetes community because we all get a little bit tired of syringes and juice box, although they're lovely as well. So all of these diabetes projects, you know, whether it was super intentional or maybe a slightly more subconscious, they participated in the design process, right? What was that initial insight that allowed for a problem statement to be defined and then worked through through some prototyping and some testing. In the case of the One Club, right, it was simply that for me, I found a whole group of type one diabetics who simply did not trust the community. They didn't think it was as magical and as wonderful as I know it to be. And so for me, the problem was, okay, how do I get these people to the community? Because I know if they just participate in a few events, they'll understand why I am trying to push so hard for them to go, right? So the answer to that problem was, well, it's through storytelling. If I create this story about a secret society and I have these characters and I can show that there's, you know, more to this type 1 diabetes community than um, what they think, then perhaps they'll get there, right? So. I did myself walk through the design process. So, um, like I mentioned, a big part of the design process is this idea of co-design or what we call participatory design. And the idea is to in view, involve the user throughout the stages of the design process to make sure that their needs are met. But what this also means, especially to me as an instructor, is that I'm not relying, and me as a designer, I'm not relying on my own expertise as a designer through this process. It's very much collaborative. And in fact, it, the end result will be so much better if I involve as many people as possible in the process. One of the big issues with co-design that I see all the time with my students is the lack of what we call creative confidence. So while people want to participate in the design process, they think, well, I can't even draw. I can't even begin to uh, cut something out and paste it down. I'm not a designer. I'm not uh, capable of participating in this design process. And just to sort of end off my presentation, I do want to introduce you to four individuals who are really incredible at convincing people of their creative confidence. And the first one is Sir Ken Robinson. So if you haven't already seen his very, very famous TED talk called Do Schools Kill Creativity? I recommend you watch it because he really is an advocate for having people understand that the creative process, creativity is a really important part of education. And that with the current curriculum and our current systems, we often neglect creativity. So I'm sure a lot of you at some point, even in elementary school, uh, you know, we're told that someone else in the class, you know, was maybe better at drawing than you. And even just being told that, you know, your horse doesn't really look like a horse, you immediately begin to lose some of your creative confidence. So Sir Ken Robinson really believes we're born creative and that a lot of it is suppressed during our early childhood education, unfortunately. The next individual, who's actually Canadian, but uh, 
lives in New York and works in New York is Bruce Mao. Um, and he currently has what we call the Massive Change Network and they do incredible work. Um, you know, he's redesigned elements of Mecca. He helped rebrand Guatemala. Like these are big, big projects. But he's a lot of fun and he really, really believes that a big part of design is communication and a big part of communication is what we call sketch. And so for me, I sketch through all of my projects. But if one of you looked at my sketches, you'd probably be like, what is this? I think there's a big difference between sketching and drawing. And so I try to tell my students all the time, it's not about artistic ability, it's not about drawing, it's about whether or not your sketch can communicate your idea. So just as a really quick little exercise for any of you who have paper, pencil, and pen, um, I just want you to draw three things. So the first one I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give you very limited time to draw, but um, do your best, okay? So the first thing I want you to draw is a camel. And just draw quickly. Okay, wrap it up, let's stop. So <clears throat> the majority of you, I can, even without looking at what you've drawn, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but the majority of you likely drew a camel with one or two humps, doesn't matter, inside profile, right? No one probably drew a camel walking towards you um, because we all have this idea of a camel inside profile, right? So quick little sketch, this is what a camel is. You've communicated the idea of a camel. Sometimes I have students who draw like a pack of smokes, like camels, um, but most people draw a camel inside profile. Okay, the second thing I want you to draw, here we go, is 75%. Communicate through sketch 75%. All right, wrap up your sketch. So some of you may have drawn you know, a glass that's 75% full or a battery or a pie with, you know, three quarters filled in. A bunch of you probably just wrote 75% because that is a perfect way to sketch 75%, right? Very legitimate. And the third thing I want you to do again, super quick, is sketch a piece of vanilla cake and a piece of chocolate cake. Okay, so wrapping that up, you know, it could be as easy as two triangles with one of them filled in, right? Um, you know, the, the key with that sketch and the key with that piece of communication is how do you differentiate the piece of chocolate cake from the piece of vanilla cake, right? And there's lots of different ways of doing that. But the idea is that, and this is something Bruce Mao really, really promotes is that's all you need. Little, little sketches, you're talking, you're communicating an idea, it's, that's it. That's all you need to engage in the design process. Okay, and the last two are the Kelly brothers. David Kelly in particular, big part of IDEO, which is one of the largest, I'm sure lots of you have heard of IDEO, global uh, design agencies in the world based in the States. And, David Kelly has a really fantastic TED Talk on creative confidence. And in that, he talks about the individual who designed the MRI machine that I showed you earlier. So this individual, he is not a designer. He actually came to Stanford. At Stanford, the Kellys have created what's called D-School. And it's a program at Stanford that brings together a bunch of different people from different backgrounds, different disciplines, and they work through the design process to come up with solutions. And this individual came to D-School and he said, look, 
kids are crying. They are traumatized from the MRI machine. I want to work through the design process with you guys to come up with some sort of solution. Right. So I encourage you to watch that TED talk because um, it's such a wonderful story. And again, he talks about lots of other things having to do with creative confidence. So I really believe that we have, <clears throat> sorry, the capability <clears throat> to collaborate and to work together in design. And I truly believe that's where the best work happens. And there's an opportunity in the community to do more of this, right? There are these wonderful design projects and these design examples, but I personally want to see more and more and more. And I think what's so cool about the community is that really the only thing that bonds us together is this disease. And apart from that, we are vastly different and vastly varied. And sometimes that works against the community because there's so many different personalities and there's so many different interests. But a lot of the time it works for the community and in particular that would really work for design because design is strengthened by that interdisciplinary collaborative approach. So I challenge you guys to come up with some really difficult problems about your own management, and this won't be hard, um, you know, sit down after this and sort of go through this process. It's a very, very um, relieving process to be able to take some bit of insight, right? Again, what's interesting is that we can be both designer and user. So take some sort of insight from your own personal management and define a problem statement and really narrow in on that problem statement, right? And then just go through the brainstorming exercises. You don't need to necessarily prototype and test, but can you rapidly come up with a bunch of random, weird, extreme, small, big solutions to this problem, right? In the community, I find that it's really easy for us to get to the empathy stage, it gets more challenging to start actually sitting down and defining things in a really concise, small way. And then sometimes we get really blocked at the ideate phase and we just don't continue. So I really hope that I see more of this happening in the community. And I think that we have a lot to worry and stress about, but we also have a lot of ways of coming up with solutions to these problems. It's not impossible. There's a lot of people out there working on stuff, which gives me a lot of hope. And I look forward to, to future endeavors. So thank you for listening. Um, if you want to chat at any point, you can reach me in so many different ways. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. That's awesome, Lucy. Thank you so much. So we, uh, yeah, thank you from on behalf of Connected Emotion. That was awesome. So interesting. And uh, also thank you very much to everybody that has uh, joined this talk. Kieran's going to post uh, a link to um, Lucy's podcast and also to her TED talk. Uh, and then if, yeah, everybody should have that, that pen and paper if you want to write down um, her, her um, email, uh, that'd be perfect too. And uh, just to give everybody a heads up, Kieran's also going to post a link to a survey uh, just about this session. If you don't mind uh, taking a moment to fill that out, that'd be great. That just helps us for future sessions. And uh, Lucy, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. If anybody has any questions, you can, you can write them down now and maybe Lucy uh, can, can answer those. Um, Lucy, they should pop up in the chat if anybody has questions.